have a prepaid call from an inmate at State Prison, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using. How you doing, bro? Morning, morning. Uh, well, um, first and foremost, I'm looking for a friend or someone that I can talk to or pin bell or uh, support or people that can support me while I'm incarcerated and and also and um thank you for this opportunity that I came across to uh, have this interview with someone on the phone and hopefully this interview will go out good and hopefully reach you someone out there that needs someone to talk to like myself. And thank you. Okay, so what do you go by? I go by Fano, that's A N O. What's your nationality? Uh Samoan. Were you ever part of any gangs, groups, organizations? No, I wasn't I wasn't being a part of any gang or any associate, but I was hanging around. I have friends being part of the gang, so I was just associated with them, but I wasn't part of any gang before. I was just basically I was at the wrong with the wrong crowds, at the wrong place at the wrong time. But I was I was hanging around with those people. I have friends; they are part of the gang. Okay, where you from out here in the streets, bro? I'm from uh, San Francisco, the area. Okay, would you able to elaborate on, on uh, what type of uh, um, gang that you were uh, hang out with or associated with? Well, basically it's not like turf. I don't know if you're familiar with that, like turf, like neighborhood. So I was, uh, I was from Honey's Point. Frisco, San Francisco. So it's like a low income, a low income uh, housing, and basically we're like turf, like neighborhood. Okay, um, can you elaborate um, a little bit of um, your childhood upbringing and um, what led you to um, hanging out with you know, um, you know these individuals? Okay, well, first and foremost, I was born and raised in the island of Samoa. And my upbringing, life when I was a young kid, growing up to a young boy to a young adult, I came from a, a good home, a good family. And I left uh, the island of Samoa when I was 13 years old came out here to the USA and I started hanging out. I started going to school. I was doing good in high school and I started hanging out with friends and from one thing led me to another day and I stopped going to school and most of the time I started hanging out with friends because I see the way they live, that's life. Money, cars, and you know, so that's how my life ended up and, and let me in prison. Okay, what are you um, incarcerated for and how long is your sentence? Well, I mean, uh, I'm incarcerated uh, robbery, a bank robbery gone bad and a person died and uh um, I mean here I'm long sentence I'm doing a life without mm -hmm. and also and also um I fall under that new law. I don't know if you're familiar with it, uh the Senate Bill the Senate Bill fourteen thirty seven. 
I fought under that bill, that new law, and I went out to court last year for resentencing under that new law, and now, now uh, my family's on the border for bill, and so I'll be coming home soon under that new law. So right now I'm waiting to go back to court uh, anytime soon under that new law. But that's that's my long sentence. I'm doing a life with that. And how long you been incarcerated? Uh, 19 years. Okay, um, do you have co-defendants? Yes. Okay, um, I'm familiar with the New York law, SB 1437, so it states that um, um, if you want a participant, like say you were a driver, you didn't um, know that they were going to um, do the crime and things of that nature, yes. and then you qualify for resentencing. So my question to you is, um, without incriminating yourself, because um, I know you're going through appeals, um, yes. can you um, elaborate on the events that occurred that land you in prison? And also, do you believe that you have a, that you had a fair trial and a fair sentence? No, I did not believe that I have a fair trial. I didn't have a fair trial whatsoever. And also, I didn't have a fair sentencing because I know English is my second language. You know, and back then I didn't really know anything about laws and stuff like that. But ever since I've been incarcerated and I educated myself in here by going to the law library and look up laws and stuff that I don't understand, and and you just learn from it. And so I look back during my trial back then I didn't have a fair trial and sentencing. I believe that I didn't get the, uh, a fair sentence because I had my transcript sentencing with me and I looked into my sentencing transcript and it said a whole total, uh, total different uh, stuff in it. And it said that my total term in Department of Correction is 17 years and four months. And I really believe that's the time I'm supposed to do in prison, 17 years and four months. Because when I got convicted, I got convicted with the first degree murder, attempted murder, and a robbery. And when I got sentenced, I got sentenced under that felony murder rule with special circumstances. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And that's how I got the first degree murder because a person died doing a robbery and I did not do it. I didn't do it, somebody else did it. So, and that's the whole reason why I'm still locked away because in my sentencing transcript, they added, they said that my total term is 17 years and four months with an added of 25 years to life, prior to life without the possibility of parole. So, with this new law, the FD 1407, Medical section 1170.95, they say that permit those who convicted under the felony murder, make it those, you make it your uh, murder conviction. And that's why I fall under that law, under the uh, Senate Bill 1437. And if they would have vacated my murder conviction, and the remaining education was left over in 17 years and four months, and I've been now 19 years, so I would be concerned. And yes, I didn't have a fair trial. I didn't even have a, a fair uh, sentencing. Um, okay, did um, the co defendants or your crimes, did they um, take the stand against you, and were there any other witnesses? Well, on that, on, on that point, uh, back then, all of us went individual. And one of my one of my co defendants he took the he took the blame for what he did. So we all went we all went separate during our trial, each of each and they had witness on the stand and they could have they could have point finger at me or whatsoever. So and uh, also my other my other two co defendants they took deals. 
and I took the I took months to trial. When you first went to prison, hit the main line. What was your mentality? Well, this is uh, my first time ever in prison. So uh, when I came in prison at the age of 26, you know my mentality was like, you know, with the life without. The life without sentencing, and my mentality was like, you no, know, this is it for me. It's gonna be my home, and I was never gonna see my family again with that, that sentencing. So, as someone like myself, never been in prison, and first time ever, you know, it's, it's a whole new world for me. Like, so I told myself this is my inside world when I first, first, first came to prison back then. And, you know, my mentality was just observed and through my time and not get into the other different races or disrespect no other races. Just be respectful all the time and that was my mentality. I just try to stay out of the way the best I can and just do, do my time. But that was my mentality. Yes. Based upon your crime and your sentence, I'm assuming that you went to a level 4, 180. Now, can you um, tell us what prison that you um, first went to? And also, do you face any challenges like altercations and riots and things of that nature? And can you also elaborate on that? Well, when I got to prison, I was at San Quentin Reception in 2005. And uh, my first, first, first prison was uh, Burn Valley, North Burn, in Delano, 180 level 4. And I was on D York on the main line. And uh, at that time, start off my time as an L Wob, you know, I had to go through all the phases of uh, close custody. I was a close A for 10 years. And being a close A, you know, you hardly get any kind of action program being a close A. So I gotta be in a cell doing count. And the only time that I'll get to program like your time, uh, the only job that I have as a help up was uh, I gotta I gotta work around the gunner. So it work as a jar crew or border. And being out in the day room and I gotta be in the cell at eight o'clock at night or before eight because of the close custody. So education, I read a lot of books in the cell just to educate myself in self-help group, you know, like uh, CGA, self-help seat. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Because being, in a, being on a level four is not, it's not the same being in level three and level two. Program is different. Being in level four is 23 hours lockdown. Something is always something happening on the yard or inside a building or anywhere on the level four when I was at Grand Valley. And leaving level four, coming my first time going down to level three, it's a little free, little freedom. Not all, you know. Like what I mean by that is like level three, it gave me a little, little freedom or more program. Know, to compare to level four one eighty, and and as a uh, and as a uh, uh, different being a uh, one eighty level four, because being in one eighty level like one eighty level four is is complicated because you uh, you been around a lot of guys that you come out of the shoe or guys that been locked up before me and. So it's hard, man. It's hard to, you know. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot uh, from doing time 180 level four. 
you know, as a young man to a uh, grown to uh, a person I am right now, I learned a lot from 180 number four, man. You know. Okay, yeah. you being you being Samoan and um, I'm being Asian. I was once incarcerated, and um, I know the politics in there, and um, yeah. you know, in in those level of prisons. Can you elaborate on? Um, any violence that you've seen or, or, or got involved in, like, you know, like, for instance, you might have a riot over a table for, for, for months and, and, and maybe even a year. Oh, yeah. You know, can you elaborate yeah. on, 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 like, things that would get an individual in a wreck or, or even cause a riot? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. Well, when I was uh, back then, 180, never for Crime Valley, uh, for example, like, we played basketball, we share one basketball ball with the blacks, or we share bars with the blacks. And so you already know, so you already know how us also in Asia, we, 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 we like them. So if any of the homies or any, any of the bros are playing basketball with, you know, with the blacks in the ball, and any blacks are there. Or pick up a fire with, with any of the blood, or any of the, one of us from the family, and they're always going to take or take one person, you know, argue in, or over a bar, you know. Sometimes it's always over a, a basketball game or a bar. And I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen, you know, and. And then, you know, things hit the fans, man. And, you know, I got no other choice. I got no other choice but to get in. You know, that's part of the, uh, I guess that's part of doing time in prison. You know? And I see, I see a lot of that happening on the yard. Riot kick off, you know? Over a basketball game or uh, the ball, the workout area, the bars. And so I've been, I've been a few, I've been a few, uh, right? We are the races. We are. And like I said, I got no other choice but to get involved. What do you have to say um, to the youngsters out here, homie? that um is involved in gang activity or thinking about joining man. gangs? <laughs> well, man, that's that's a good question, man, because that, that is something that I really, 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 really wanna do if everything goes good for my for my um uh, for my case and I come home and that's something that I really am passionate about to help the youth out there. You know, and because I used to do, I used to do that in Iowa before I came to this person, Chakawala. I was part of the mentor uh, for you from the street, the high school coming from the street. So I was, I had four tour with different high school when I was in Iowa. And that is something big, big, big that I'm passionate about um, with youth out there. Well, my message and my advice to all the youth out there if they watch this interview about me and, um, you know, life is too short, man. Life is too short, and and life is like a switch light. You know, just focus, just focus on school and listen to your parents, mom and dad. And you know, if you need help, and don't hesitate. Ask your teacher. Ask your, if you have older siblings, ask your older sibling for help, ask your mom, your dad for help, and if not, find find someone that you can trust in and ask, ask help, you know, like I say, life is too short and life is like a light switch. When you turn off that light switch, all you see is darkness. And when you turn on the light switch, all you see is your light bright. And my advice for you guys, you out there, you know, pushing is not the place that you want to come to. There's nothing in here, nothing in here. And my advice for you guys out there, that you, you know, you want to be joining a gang, activity, gang, whatever, whatever, it's not what, at the end of the day, 
the only people is gonna be supporting you while you come in person is your like uh, your family, your loved ones, your so-called friends, your homies, your homeboys, your whoever. They're not gonna be there to support you while you're doing time. And the only people who's gonna suffer from all your action is your family, especially mom, dad, you know, the people that are close to you. So my advice for you guys, the youth out there, just stay focused. Keep your eyes on the prize, man, you know. Sky's the limit. So like I say, you know, hopefully hopefully everything goes good and I come home, I will I will uh come and evolve with the youth out there and and that's something I really, really wanna do when I come home is to talk to youth and help the youth and if I can help one, maybe two, three youth and I'll be a happy person while I'm still walking on this earth, man, but you know but that's my message for the youth out there. You know, life is too short. You know. All right, Oof. Um, I don't have no more questions for you, but do you have anything else to address, uh, to address or add? Yeah, man. Um, well, you know, man. I, I just, well, man. Thank you for this opportunity, man. Um, to talk to you and on the phone and do this interview with yourself, man. I appreciate it for the opportunity, and uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a blessing. Oh God, man, you know, to come across with another image in here doing time with me and guide me and, and uh, recommend me to, to have an interview with you. It was a blessing to uh, have an interview with you and, you know, this is new to me. It's new to me and i never done this before, but, you know, and uh, hopefully whoever out there all over the world or watching this uh, interview, you know, I just want to say, uh, God bless everyone out there, your family, everybody, and, uh... You have 60 seconds remaining. And I want to give uh, a shout-out to, uh, my family, you know, miss you guys, and, uh, and, uh, God will give me, uh, uh, a second chance pretty soon, and I'll be home soon. And everyone out there that know me and did time with me and, you know, I just want to say God bless your family and uh, all y'all family out there. And uh, one day, I'll be home. And uh, I know God's going to give me a second chance eventually. And uh, one day, I'll be home soon. And... Uh, I say thank you, man. Thank you for this opportunity and I appreciate it for your everything and your interview.